Friends, we have gathered this day to give thanks for the life of Stanley Brian Chrisman, known to us, his friends, as Stan, to bear witness to the resurrection, to seek comfort and hope one with the other. And as we gather in this place, God is surely our refuge and our strength. I invite you to join with me in our opening sentences. We gather to celebrate the life of Stan Chrisman, to affirm with praise and thanksgiving the goodness of the Lord. We have gathered to celebrate the entry of Stan Chrisman into life eternal, to witness to our faith, to come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. Would you pray with me, please? O Thou, in whom we live and move and have our being, so fill our hearts with trust in You, that in all times and in all seasons, we may, without fear or distress, commit ourselves and those dear to us to Your steadfast love, in this life and in the life to come. Living or dying, we belong to You, through Him who is the resurrection and the life, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
may be seated. At this time, let me invite Stan's grandsons to come forward and to share with us scripture readings. All right, so this is from Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my souls. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall, not, uh, shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. A reading from John 14. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many, many dwelling places, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This is a poem I heard recently at another funeral, and I really liked it, and I wanted to read it to you. It's called The Dash. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. I'd like to think that my dad filled his dash to overflowing. Thank you, Anita. At this time, let me invite Kevin and Steve, Stan's sons-in-law, to share with us words of remembrance. I'm gonna start out with a joke. How do you identify a dogwood tree? If it, by its bark. The family would recognize this. Stan had habits. And one was most endearing of him was games. Games tied groups together. Games tied family together. 
and it used it to the full extent. One of those games was holidays, gatherings, birthdays. He would hide a piece of paper under a plate for dinner. And at the end of dinner, he would then say, pull it out, and you'd have to open it up and go around the table and read your joke. And the family then would try to figure out what the answer was. Group game. Worked out really well. How many of us looked under the plate before a dinner <laughs> to see if that paper was there? I didn't. But he did lots of different games. The girls going down the steps for Christmas morning, one step at a time. Uh, Kevin will probably mention something about the Christmas trees with the gifts in the Christmas trees. We would all go out as a family, find the, find the gift that was hidden in the tree. It was usually a bag with somebody's name on it. You had to get somebody else's name. And you had to bring it in, and we would all sit around the table, and then you would pass the gifts to the person that you had their bag for. Vacation games, when we would go north up to Acadia, he was a treasure trove of card games, of card games. Stan did not really work with the board games you would buy. He would work with his own creative games. So card games like Predict, Rook, not just for a game of four, we would have games of 20. And he would triple, double, triple the decks, regular card decks with these games. And we'd be up late at night playing these games. He never really took to the regular board games, but there, there was one game he always mentioned every now and then, and that was Monopoly. Always after these late nights sometimes, he would, after everybody was tired and ready to go to bed, he would say, I'm up for a game of Monopoly. <laughs> I don't think anybody ever took him up on that. But, you know, activities and games, another activity uh, thing, which kind of like a game to him that he would use for these group dynamics all the time, was dancing. The girls, I remember, he probably did something for Boy Scouts when he was in Boy Scouts, but the girls, I know, Indian princesses, he choreographed their dance routines as Indian princesses. He also, in my, in my time, I remember him, I remember practicing out on the porch in front of the house before our wedding, um, learning, learning the, a circle dance, because what he focused on was was traditional um, group uh, culture dances. So he wanted to have these circle dance as part of our wedding ceremony to get people out to dance onto the dance floor. I know we had fun doing it. I don't know if everybody else actually joined us or not, but it worked really well. But these were all things that made Stan unique in his character. He, he took advantage of that, and it worked towards group dynamics. It worked towards solidifying the groups. It worked towards solidifying the family. Another endearing quality that he had was he loved to talk. You have to decide whether you want to ask him a question on something. Because if you did, you might be in for the long haul, whether you wanted it or not. And many times his stuff that he gave you was very wise, very appropriate. But let it, then you may want to move on, but it might take another hour before you would get away. But he was very, very good at that. My one recollection of it was the first time that I met the family was at their house. Uh, dating a NATO was in the summer, so that was almost 40 years ago now. And Stan, we were sitting down having dinner. Stan was doing his regular thing, we were talking. I'd ask him about his business, what he does, which that starts opening up the door, and he starts talking. And I think because I knew a little bit about electronics, about computers and programming, that kind of fed into it a little more. But then all of a sudden the ladies abandoned me and Stan went out into the kitchen. And I sat there for quite a long time, trying to figure out a way to get out of this conversation. And if anybody in the family knows, it's hard to do that with Stan because it just rolled, even if you tried to change the subject, you come back into the, in the subject again eventually. But eventually I got away and I learned my first Christmas home etiquette, home family etiquette. 
when I asked Adina, once I got up to her, I said, oh, I couldn't get away from your dad. I mean, I like talking to him, but I wanted to talk to her. I remember her comment was, oh, you just get up and walk away. <laughs> Eventually, he'll catch on and realize nobody's there listening. <laughs> so, but everything that Stan did, um, he did out of love. He did out of love for family and of friends. Um, and I think at best that could be placed is Corinthians 13, which described best him, captures him, and what love is, which defines what love is. Stan was patient, Stan was kind, he wasn't envious, he didn't boast, or he wasn't proud, although he was proud and boasted of his grandchildren. He wasn't self-seeking, he, was, he wasn't easily angered. He held no records of people that did stuff wrong to him. He rejoiced in the truth, he protected, he trusted, he hoped, and persevered. And with that, I know that Stan is, will be waiting for us to play a game of Monopoly when we see him. But before I go, for the sake of games, what's the funniest kind of birthday party you can throw for a dog? No one? <laughs> a ball. On behalf, of course, Mother and Teresa and Anita, thanks to everybody making the effort today to be here for that. So I had the pleasure of watching Dad for the last 32 years. And in my eyes, sitting there watching, observing, it looked to me like he had always done everything right. He was a good son. He was a playful and mischievous little brother. And even well into his senior years, he and his sister Aunt June would kind of poke and tease each other. He met mom at a dance. He fell in love with her. They had a beautiful family. And quickly he devoted himself to Sandy, Teresa, and Anita. He became a provider and a role model, making him a great father and a great husband. And as we all know here, most of us, he was a great scientist. He worked in the field of physics, something he really loved. However, there was another side to dad besides the science and the technology. He was also a farmer. Christmas trees, honeybees, chickens, family garden. Mom and dad's family garden is basically the size of this room, so it's, it's very impressive. And I often envied him because two or three times a month, he'd have his entire immediate family around their very long and beautiful dining room table with his daughters, then eventually their husbands, and eventually grandchildren one by one, and then even a great grandchild. And we were there to share, to talk, to laugh, and I thought, oh, gosh, what a lucky guy. He, he's really done it. He did everything right. Dad was part of Bell Labs, which was the cutting edge research lab of its time. I mean, this was the place for technology, ideas, new inventions. And sometime he'd come home and he'd talk about lunchtime in the cafeteria at Bell Labs. The scientific sharing that would go down in this room, I mean, really probably could have made a special Channel 13 movie out of it. With these teams of scientists and what they were working on, Dad really, really enjoyed that. And some of these people were Nobel Peace Prize winners. Dad was part of a wonderful team, and he loved it. And yet, in that same breath of science and technology, Dad would be the first person to remind us that he went to a one-room schoolhouse in Centerport, Pennsylvania. His father was a World War I medic. I mean, literally, Dad's life was looking in the future but his origins were almost from the previous century. Dad's town of Centerport on the map is just a teeny tiny speck, but it was rich in character and charm. 
Almost, it reminded me of a normal Norman Rockwell painting. And when Dad lived there, it was something truly special. There was a center port band. Dad played the clarinet. I believe his father played the tuba. His mom played the flute. I mean, talk about family activities. And there were Saturday night dances. And Dad could dance, as Steve said. He took lessons. He taught lessons. And I'm told that back in their heyday, he and Mom had a reputation for being the first out on the dance floor and the last to leave. There was also a thriving Sunday school at Centerport and, of course, Boy Scouts. This town that Dad came from was forged by hard work, education, integrity, and principles. And these are the same values that Dad held on to his entire life. A simpler way of living, for sure, but these stories and fond memories of Centerport were always at the tip of his tongue, and he loved talking about it. When I first came into the family and I was, had the pleasure of knowing and being with Teresa, I knew after about six months that she was the woman for me. And we, of course, would discuss our faiths and our future. And I asked Teresa what she and her family would do on Sundays for church. And she said most of the times they would go to the Lebanon Methodist Church. And then Teresa also told me that on times that they didn't make it to church, that dad, and mom, Anita and Teresa would take a walk back into their woods on a Sunday morning, way back. It was a very large rock was in the middle of the forest. That rock had a name. It was called Sunday School Rock. Anita and Teresa would climb up on that rock where mom and dad would either read from the Bible, maybe sing a church hymn or two, or perhaps, just maybe, it sit and listen to God's creation. Well, when Teresa told me this story, I knew at that moment we were going to be husband and wife. This precious and honest story filled with reverence captured the very essence of a loving and caring God, the God that mom and dad chose to raise their family with. And I'm happy to say that that love continues to this very hour right here this afternoon. Some grandparents are couch grandparents, but not mom and dad. Camping, hiking, fishing, canoeing, overnights, brooking, they were the active type. They were doers. And who could forget the long drive down to Ocean Grove to hear that massive organ play, which mother and dad loved very much, and our incredibly rewarding vacations, as Steve mentioned, to Maine, where we were inspired by Dad and Mom and their membership to the Appalachian Mountain Club that provided such a wonderful classroom to our children. And for a matter of fact, for all of us, really, an opportunity to learn about each other, grow closer, and to explore God's wonder. A couple of years after Mom and Dad had moved to New Jersey, they had purchased a dining room table from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And this is the table that I mentioned before, where all the family dinners would, would happen at Mom and Dad's house. Now, if this table could talk, the banter, the stories, the long stories in Steve's case, the additions of new humans, the laughter, the joy, the birthday parties, I know it was special, I know it was meaningful, because now, you know, our children, dad's grandchildren, are in their 20s and 30s, and they still come. It still has meaning. They make an effort to be at Nana and Pop-Up's table for that meal. That's how you know it's something special, when a young adult truly makes that effort. For a man who partook in cutting-edge technology, but came from humble beginnings, he lived in two different worlds, really. A man who could have easily been above others and out of reach, but instead, he chose kindness and fellowship. About seven months ago, I lost my mom. And after a couple weeks had passed, I had a nice chat with Dad. And he would often say this phrase, you know, so how's Kevin doing? Right? He'd always try to get focused on, on you. And I shared briefly my thoughts with Dad about where I thought my mom was, and maybe possibly what she was doing, and who she might be with, what she was experiencing. And Dad agreed that heaven was a place where you'll be reunited with others who passed before us. 
And Dan also said that he hoped heaven was a place where we'll all understand the questions and the mysteries that maybe he wasn't able to, to figure out while he was here. And then he said, you know, I, I sure do hope there's an organ up there playing all the time. And he said, you know what, as a matter of fact, if there isn't an organ, I'm not sure I want to go. <laughs> so I told him to keep that one down. I told him that there definitely was an organ playing 24-7, but what he should be focusing on is that opening in the choir and get that first tenor spot. So in following with Dad's thoughts on heaven, my prayer today is that Dad is reunited with his mom, his dad, and with Aunt June. My prayer is now that Dad is, is somehow even smarter than he was while he was here. And my prayer is that he's singing at that big organ, He's singing songs of faith, joy, and he's singing about eternal life. Thank you, Steve. And Kevin for sharing with such courage and such love. Friends, I invite you to join your hearts once again with mine as we turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, source of all mercy and giver of comfort, deal graciously with those who mourn that casting all their sorrow upon you, they may know the consolation of your love. O oh God, before whom generations rise and pass away, we give you thanks for all your servants who having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. Especially this day, we thank you for Stan. We praise you for the gift of his life, for all in him that was good, and kind and faithful. We thank you that for him death has passed and pain has ended, and that he has now entered into the joy which you have prepared. Grant to Sandy and Anita and Teresa and their entire family circle a peace which passes all understanding even as they journey through this dark valley. God of grace in Jesus Christ, you promised many rooms within your house. Give us faith to see beyond touch and sight some sure sign of your kingdom. And where vision fails to trust your love, which never fails. Lift heavy sorrow and give us good hope in Jesus so that we may bravely walk our earthly way and look forward to glad reunion in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And I'm thankful to our chancel choir for honoring him with their voices today. It's good for us to be together so that we can surround each other with comfort and care. As we grieve, in this way, we can become a gift to one another. And this afternoon, we remember that this sanctuary is a holy space, not only because of our company one with the other, but we remember that God, creator of heaven and earth, stoops down ever so tenderly to share in these moments with us. God, who knows us each by name, hearts that are broken and tears that have been shed. God promises to carry us through these moments and beyond them as shepherd and guide. And so beyond all of the sadness and separation that might seek to hold sway in this hour, we say, that Stan has not passed only now from life to death, but rather more. Stan has passed now from death to life eternal. Behold, God face to face has joined that great cloud of witnesses. And so this service is above all else, a service of witness to the resurrection. Sometimes, as a pastor, you come to know people only in one particular chapter of their lives. And it has been a real gift to me over the years knowing Stan and even after his passing to come to know more about the other chapters in Stan's very rich and very full life. Sandy, what a book of life you wrote together with your beloved Stan. It's a book that almost didn't happen, though, isn't it? You first met on the tennis courts when you were in nursing school. However, when Stan came back later to step out with you again, he told the house mother that he was here to see a Sally Schultz. Thank goodness for an astute house mother who knew that the young lady he was looking for rather went by the name of Sandy Swartley. <laughs> and so from then on, together you were, and together you stayed. Your family tree grew as you welcomed Anita and Teresa. And all the while that Stan was building a very accomplished career, he never for a second forgot where his priorities lay, investing deeply in your family life together. Once upon a time, a Boy Scout himself, Stan was proud to call himself then a Girl Scout. Anita and Teresa leading your troop in backpacking trips and outdoor adventures, instilling in both of you the love and appreciation for nature, which was such a true hallmark of his life. He was the dad who knew how to fix everything, and he was never short on advice to offer, whether that advice was welcome or not. He loved you fiercely. You never for a minute had to doubt that love as you grew and as you built lives of your own with Steve and Kevin. In fact, Steve and Kevin were never just sons-in-law to him. They were his sons. And as they shared their own remembrances today, it is clear that that was a mutual affection. What a gift. What joy his beloved grandchildren and granddaughter-in-law and great-grandson 
brought to his life. Brendan and Brian and Andrew and Emily and Grace, without a doubt, your pop-up was one of the smartest people that you knew. And perhaps that it is good for you to know today that he thought just the same of each one of you. When he spoke of you, he glowed with pride. He was always there for you, whether it was 4-H events or concerts, Boy Scouts, marching band, Jack and Nori stories, hop on pop, summer days at Furnace Lake, his endless quest to teach you physics. Special gifts for each of you on the Christmas tree farm. Let's not forget all of that polka and square dancing. Enough love, enough laughter, and enough memories for a lifetime. The legacy he leaves you with is a rich one. It is my prayer for those of you in front of me fortunate enough to call him family, that the goodness of his life will influence your own in the days and the weeks and the months that lie ahead. I already know that you will make him very proud. Stan was an accomplished scientist, creating complex systems both at work and at home, some of which you're still trying to figure out. His brilliant mind never seemed to rest. He was a lover of the outdoors, hiking, fishing, swimming, beekeeping, even at times a competitive volleyball player. He was a lover of games, and as Steve already mentioned, he was always loath to see an evening with family draw to a close, and he'd be quick to say, aren't you ready for a game of Monopoly? As I read over Stan's obituary, which is on the back of your bulletins today, I was struck by the humility with which his family recalled his life. That's a sure case of the apple not falling far from the tree, because humility was a defining characteristic of Stan's life. That humility spilled over into his life of quiet yet steadfast faith, a faith which we are privileged to have nurtured here at Clinton Presbyterian, a faith which was shared here at Clinton Presbyterian. A steady presence in the back row of our choir. He went the extra mile during COVID days recording for online services. At first, he would send us audio recordings only, but never one to be stumped by technology. He was finally convinced to send us video recordings very piece which our choir sang today is one which we have of him recording with them. Creation will be at peace. As we walk now in this world without Stan's physical presence, may we find comfort in knowing that he is in the presence of the Prince of Peace himself, free from the pain which marked his journey in these last days. Our grief here, of course, continues. Our lives are richer for having known Stan, and we are the poorer now without him nearby. But our grief is for ourselves today. It's not for Stan. Now he sees God face to face and with all the love and the joy with which you might imagine, he cheers us on in our earthly pilgrimage. On my last couple of visits with Stan, he said exactly the same thing to me. He said, I just wish the Almighty would allow me 
to sing again. I assured Stan that we would keep singing for him in the meantime, holding space. And now, with Stan gathered into the kingdom eternal, the heavenly choir enhanced that tenor spot is filled. Now Stan is the one that holds space for us. Now he is the one that will keep singing for us until that day of glad reunion again, when we will sing together and for all eternity. So this day, thank God for Stan's life. Thank God for Stan's love. Thank God for Stan. He has fought the good fight. He has finished his race. He has heard at last these words. Welcome home, good and faithful servant. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen.
And now into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Stan Christman. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon and abide with you and all those who you love until we meet again, either in this place or in God's kingdom come. Amen. Amen.
family has invited all of you to join them in Fellowship Hall. If you just go through this door and follow the hallway, if you're able to. Thank you.